All right. Good morning, everybody. This is Coach Reese and Coach Loretta with the Dirt Trail Running Podcast coming at you with our Coach's Corner segment, something that I personally like to call Coffee with Coaches. I don't know how everybody else feels about it, but I will be voraciously sucking down some nectar today. Um, Coach Loretta, how are you doing? I am doing pretty great. I'm excited. It's March Madness and let the games begin in just a few minutes. Whoop, whoop. Wonderful. So before we get to our topic today about muscular and metabolic fatigue, is it good or bad? And when should we feel it? Um, I wanted to ask you how your past couple of days and how training's been going. Okay. So I've been um, working through a little bit of niggles. I've had some little bit of tightness. And so I've been working with my amazing physical therapist. Love physical therapists. They're just so smart at what they do and um, skilled. And uh, so your caffeine kind of reminds me before I came yesterday she said she was going to um, load up on some caffeine before I got there, so she'd be ready for me. I said either caffeine or whiskey. One of the two is going to have to get you through the session with me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so just kind of working through some things, doing some dry needling, and I'm feeling pretty good today. So I think we may have finally gotten to the source of my issue. Wonderful. That's awesome. Um, super happy for you. And it's always great to have a team in uh, your corner, whether it's physical therapists, nutritionists, coaches, whoever it is, just to kind of help support and give guidance. So that way, you know, you can give uh, you can give your 100 percent at your uh, at your your activity of choice. So it's good sure. to hear that you have that team around you. Yeah. So how's your morning? So my morning's going pretty good. Um, me and my girlfriend are going to be running a half marathon on Sunday. Shout out to everybody um, at the Hill Striders um, with March Madness and the Cary Half Marathon that's going on. Um, so we're going to be doing that and volunteering on Saturday. So today was kind of a cutback long run for me. Um, had a little bit of extra time too. So, um, you know, I went over to a neighbor's house to print off some paperwork and he, uh, I got to give him a shout out. His name's Greg. He made me a delicious cup of coffee. So shout out Greg. Um, <laughs> You know, and then before getting on the podcast, I was flipping through some of my stuff and I found this old hat, this move free hat. So I wanted to give a shout out to um, Patrick Karen on the East Coast with uh, with everything that he's got going on. I got this hat probably years ago and it's been one of my favorite ones to race and train in. So I figured I'd put it on for the podcast today and give him a shout out. Nice. And it pairs nicely with your ornery mule racing hoodie. So you're good to go. Oh, yeah, totally. So, yeah, here we go right there. Um so for well, those of you who can't see, uh, Reese is looking awful sharp in his black and white <laughs> hoodie from Ornery Meal Racing. Oh, thank you very much. Um, okay, so perfect. Let's get right into our topic, um, muscular and metabolic fatigue. And I feel like this is a topic that we've all experienced at some point, but, you know, it goes without saying that, you know, defining these things will help us think about them as we're training and as we're racing. So I just wanted to define what muscular fatigue is. Um, this is coming at you from the National Institute of Health. Um, it is a decline in the maximal muscle force or capacity that one has. Um, so that's muscular fatigue. So we know this to be, um, you know, a result of muscular soreness, um, maybe high levels of training relative to one's capacity, lower levels of muscular uh, recovery, or sudden increases in overall training or other increases in intensity of training um, that one is not accustomed to. Um, metabolic fatigue, um, this is this definition is coming at us from the Sports Science Exchange. It's resultant of a depletion of ATP creating compounds that can affect the nervous system or the muscular system, um, or an influx of metabolites that in influence muscular activity. So what does that mean? That's just um, either you're depleting your energy stores, your glucose, your glycogen, um, you know, making it harder for your body to create energy to sustain your output, or it's an accumulation of factors that can inhibit contraction of muscles um, or inhibit your brain's ability to send those signals to your muscles. Um, so I guess one could say that muscular fatigue is going to be relating more to the muscles themselves, whereas metabolic fatigue is going to be relating to more your body's ability to either handle fatigue or create energy. Um, so Factors um, that are going to uh, influence our metabolic fatigue are an increase of hydrogen ions, such as when you run above threshold, everybody knows that burning lactate type of feel where, you know, you might have a metallic taste in your mouth um, or everything's kind of burning and gets heavy towards the end of a race. Um, an increase in reactive oxygen species, um, you know, this is 
um, free radicals, everybody knows them as, um, and some other compounds too that can accumulate in the muscles or surrounding tissue that can inhibit um, your, your activity. Or it could be a decrease in glycogen, it could be a decrease in blood carbohydrate, uh, decrease in ATP, phosphocreatine, um, and other energy creating compounds. Um, so some examples of muscular fatigue, we kind of got to them. Those are going to be like cramping in the muscles, inability to really contract any harder. I think we've all been in that point in a race or in a training run where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going as hard as I can, but I, I still know that I should be able to go harder. Um, and it also results in an inability to um, like push hills. I know at the end of a really long run um, or at the end of like a hundred mile race, you get to like the smallest incline and you're like, holy crap, like this hill feels huge. Whereas any other day I'd be able to just boost up it no problem. Um, some examples of muscular or uh, metabolic fatigue are going to be like bonking in the middle of a long run, um, you know, kind of having that foggy haze in your brain. Um, a decrease in motivation when you're running. If you're just like, Oh my gosh, like I got this fog. I don't want to keep going, but my muscles feel fine. Um, or this overall feeling of lethargy. So, and those can relate to like inside of a workout or inside of a race, or it can relate to, um, one's life. You know, we can experience metabolic fatigue, prolonged metabolic fatigue with just an overall feeling of lethargy day to day. You get up and you're like, oh my gosh, I slept nine hours, but I still feel really tired. I have no motivation, um, you know, things such like that, that, that most of us have experienced. So now that we've kind of defined like, hey, what does muscular fatigue look like? What does metabolic fatigue look like? I wanted to ask you, Coach Loretta, is fatigue good or bad? What are your thoughts? So, I mean, I think we have to talk a little bit about, you know, these, these fatigues and thinking about where you are in your training, right? So a lot of um, our training is sort of designed to get you to fatigue so that you can make some physiological adaptations so you're ready for race day. So, yes, some of that muscular fatigue is something that we are working towards. So when you get to Saturday or Sunday and you're getting ready for your long run, that we expect that your legs might be tired and heavy because you've had a couple quality sessions earlier in the week. So it's not something that I would be too concerned about. But when we're look, we have to look at kind of like the extent of some of some of that, right? So if you're getting into muscular fatigue that comes from you, maybe you went to the weight room and you did uh, something that you aren't used to. Maybe you lifted super heavy and now your legs are super sore. So there's you know difference in like okay, how much fatigue do I have? And, you know, can I get through a workout without changing my form and still still be um, safe, not risking any kind of injury? So, so that's kind of what I would look at for fatigue. And I think um, as far as muscular fatigue, and then if we're looking at metabolic fatigue, that's, you know, I think when we're starting to get into some really high mileage, we're doing a lot of long runs. I think we start um, getting into feeling some metabolic fatigue. I think a lot of our training kind of uh, falls under you know, we're looking at cumulative fatigue, right? So we're looking at how um, all of the things that we're doing over the weeks, the months, maybe even the year, um, building up to a race um, that we're, we're accumulating fatigue in our muscles, which is necessary so we can make adaptations so we can get stronger, so we can get faster, so we can complete these, these races. So I think there needs to be balance. And I think um, for me, what's most important too is having conversations with my athletes about listening to their body. So let's listen to your body and see how you're feeling. So we can kind of, I, so I can kind of know and you can kind of get familiar with, okay, is this normal amount of fatigue that they're sharing with me? Or is this something that's starting to get alarming and, you know, moving into overtraining? So I think you have to have that balance and um, a close connection with your body or if you're working with a coach to help support, to make sure that we are, I guess, um, training so that, you know, there's that fine line of a, a tightrope that we walk, right, of getting into um, overtraining versus just that sweet spot of training where we want to be. So um, for me, looking at both of those and thinking about those to see where an athlete is, what's normal for them, what's, what's not looking normal for them, what are some kind of signs I'm going, okay, this is a bit much, maybe today's a good day for rest day, or you know what, go out there and try to um, – run a mile or two, see how you feel. If you feel good, keep going. You're not, maybe you need to call it a day, you know, so kind of those things. How about you? What are you thinking when you're working with athletes and, 
and you maybe you have an athlete that reaches out to you and says, you know, I'm super tired after yesterday's long run. I just don't think I can do the recovery run today. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot there. And I think we can boil it down to um, is fatigue good or bad? It depends. What time of the year is it? When is your next race, right? If we are training, of course, like there is going to be a certain level of muscular fatigue. Let's say we take a classic 16 week build into an A race, maybe, you know, like at the very start of the training block, I don't really want people to feel really fatigued at the end of the first week, right? Because we have 15 more weeks that we're going to be training. Um, I don't want people feeling very fatigued muscularly, um, you know, uh, workout to workout. I don't want people to do one interval session and be like, man, my, my quads are sore. My glutes hurt. My hips are trash. I don't want that because we want to feel like we're slowly and gradually increasing somebody's, um, demands in their training with periodic deloads, right? That all kind of changes, um, in my opinion, um, you know, probably about like five to six weeks out from an event. That's going to be usually where um, somebody's, um, their volume requirements and their intensity requirements start to intersect. Um, Sometimes I'll have people doing high volume, but not a lot of intensity. And then as their race comes closer, we start working in more of that specific intensity. And that's kind of where those two areas cross as the volume starts to come down, the intensity starts to come up. Um, So if we're like five to six weeks out from a race, that's really where I want people to experience the most fatigue. So I think going into training with this idea of like, hey, this is where you are going to have the most demand in your training and, um, you know, relating that to other people in your life, like a partner, your family, whatever, set their understanding that, hey, you know, you have a little bit more bandwidth taken up in this uh, this point of your training. Uh, It kind of sets the expectation that, you know what, like, yeah, the point is we're trying to get your body in a fatigued state. So that way um, we can reach those super compensation gains, right? Because of course we don't want to, um, we don't want to impose a very explicit demand that's very intense right away because that's just going to drive people into a hole, right? But we do want to, right. um, we do want to challenge somebody's capacity in order to make improvements. And whenever we challenge capacity and we try to push one's limits, a necessary repercussion of that is going to be these periods where we should feel fatigued. So I always say it is a good thing at the proper time. It is a bad thing at the improper time. Um, And of course, two weeks before a race, like we really shouldn't feel muscularly fatigued. I won't, don't want people to say like, Oh, you know, this workout's like killing me or whatever. I think that's, that kind of relates back to me as a coach in saying that like, Hey, this workout is too hard. And hopefully, um, it doesn't get to that point where I'm just finding that out two weeks before a race that a certain workout is too hard. Right. Because we've had a a good, good building block for it. Um, when we talk about metabolic fatigue in training, that's the same thing. If we're talking high mileage and low intensity, we're going to be placing a high uh, energy demand on the athlete to just keep going and keep going. So I don't want to increase somebody's volume of training so quickly that at the start of a block, they are going to feel this metabolic fatigue where, you know, at the end of a week or two, or maybe three, sometimes it takes four weeks to get to the point where you, you, you understand that you've been pushing um, somebody a little bit too hard is, you know, they'll say like, I just woke up and I slept for like 10 hours and I'm still tired. And it took me three cups of coffee to get going. And my motivation to get out for a run is like super lackluster, but I'm not really sore. Like there should be no reason why I can't just like rally and toughen up and get out there. Right. That's a good sign of metabolic fatigue. Somebody has been asking their body to produce a lot of energy that they're not then recovering from. Um, let's say if that's, if, if we planned that in a particular week, this is going to be your highest mileage week. And then we're going to start to taper off. That's an okay thing, right? Because then we know, okay, you're feeling fatigued. Maybe we do have to push a little bit um, as long as it's appropriate for the athlete and there's no um, overtraining or excuse me, um, any specific overreaching implications. Um, then we can say, you know what, that's kind of necessary. If somebody's not in the peak of their volume training and they're just building up, then, whoa, hey, we already taxed the athlete enough. We have to rewrite the training program and maybe not continue to increase volume, but decrease it slightly so that they can then recover. 
Um, so I, I agree. I think it's um, important to like work closely with your athlete to to listen to those soft signs of things that are happening because mm -hmm. of, there's a potential. You know, we're we're building in some deload weeks, but everybody's a little bit different in how they are able to handle those um, miles and that increase in miles. So having conversations because maybe you know you're starting to feel a little bit too much fatigue and and making sure that you're voicing that so that you your coach knows. And you know, I like to try to have a good idea of where, where they are, how they're feeling, what their energy levels are to determine like, okay, you know what? I think really we need to put in a deload week now, you know, it may have been sooner or a little bit later than we had planned, but, you know, kind of um, adjusting it to meet their needs, I think is important. And I also think um, having conversations about how's your sleep, how's your nutrition, you know, because as we're building, we need more food. We, you know, we, we need to be able to keep up with that. And if we're not, that could be one of the reasons that you are starting to struggle early on, maybe not towards that last build where we're, we're getting into that last training cycle right before the taper, where we're kind of expecting to be more tired. But if it's happening sooner, then it might be, I need to look, relook at, am I getting enough to eat? Am I, am I getting enough sleep? Absolutely. That's huge. And that all ties into energy availability throughout the day. And I suppose to um, recovery, right? Like mm -hmm. sometimes you'll have athletes that are training 15 to 20 hours a week. And depending on the paces that they're running, maybe they're doing, you know, um, you know, 50 to 60 miles a week, but still that's a huge time on your feet. Um, it's a huge time with which we're asking your body to be operating and producing energy quicker than a, a basal metabolic rate or just a day to day rate. So in that case, that athlete's training might be harder than somebody who's doing 100 miles a week in 12 hours because that athlete who's spending 12 hours a week is getting eight extra hours of recovery where they're kicking their feet up, maybe they're doing foam rolling, and that can relate to muscular fatigue as well as metabolic fatigue. And I think that's where people get wrapped up in the, um, in the you know, comparison trap of like, oh, so-and-so is running so many more miles than me. But then when you look at the time, it's like, yeah, they're running more as a product of they're running faster. So they get more recovery. Um, right. So I think that's where people find themselves in this trap. So f for me, it's all about asking questions of where are you at in your training? Like what kind of period are we in? Um, you know, in relaying that to athletes so that they know what to feel. Hey, I don't want you to feel that fatigue this week because we still have another three weeks with which we're building in this particular block. So if an athlete gets right. done with the workout and they're just like, man, I was tanked. It's okay. We adjust everything afterwards. You know, we push you a little bit hard right now, but that just means that we have a couple more recovery days. We make sure you don't dig yourself into too deep of a hole too soon. Otherwise, um, that overarching arc of your training might get disrupted. Right. Right. And I, I also think that it sometimes can be more of a mental um, fatigue that also plays into all of that too. So I think, um, you know, being familiar with your athlete or your body, if you're not, um, if you're self-coached and, you know, thinking about like, okay, is it like kind of weighing it out? Like what, what am I feeling right now? Is it really something that I need to back off a little bit? Or is it just that I'm mentally starting to feel a little bit fatigued because I'm putting in hours and hours of time. And that might also warrant a little bit of a deload because we don't want to take the fun out of running, right? Running is supposed to be fun and something we enjoy. It's not something that we have to do. It's something we want to do. So we want to keep that, that passion, I think. And sometimes if we start pushing too hard, we might start lose, you know, to lose that. And it, I think it's a, as a result of that, that big build, especially when we're talking about doing ultra marathons, it's a lot of time spent, you know, on your feet, maybe away from your family and your friends, you know, just out on the trails and it can kind of get to you. And it, I think it's a mental fatigue that can set in as well. Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, just a little personal anecdote. Um, earlier at the beginning of this year and the end of last year, I was doing a couple hundred mile weeks just because I like to, you know, um, it's nice hitting that number, right? Mentally, it's like, oh, I accomplished something. Um, but for me, like during that block, I had a three week block where I was doing hundred mile weeks. It was like, you know, it is a huge ask on the family. It is a huge ask. And at all points, I wasn't like, woohoo, I get to be outside for four hours right now because I'd rather be sleeping for an extra hour, right? But the understanding of knowing that like, hey, this is going to be the high volume block of my training that's then going to lead in, it kind of helps you realize and say, okay, if I am feeling a little bit of fatigue right now, that is okay because 
I'm going to have some recovery coming up. I'm going to have a change in um, workouts. Maybe I'm going to have a change in load. After I did those couple hundred mile weeks, I took two weeks of relatively lower mileage for me before I started building more intensity into my program. Um, right. So sometimes that that undulation of, okay, I'm going to put a huge demand on my time and this and my family's okay with it and we can make it work and I can still be productive at work. And then we take that recovery and then we build in some sort of um, some sort of other stimulus, it just kind of helps switch the body, switch the brain into these different gears that can help um, navigate this fatigue. Because sometimes doing the same exact thing over and over and over and over and over again is just a mental fatigue, you know? Mm -hmm. um, for sure. Going the same pace for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours can be a body fatigue, right? The body clicks into one gear, you get overuse just because the joints aren't being used in greater or smaller um, joint angles. Um, you know, as well as, you know, for me, I love speed running. I love hitting those VO2 paces. I love 5k paces. And right now I'm enjoying a lot of half marathon training and it's more mentally enjoyable for me to say, oh, you know what? I'm going to decrease the volume. I'm going to decrease the kind of that lethargy fatigue of just high mileage. So that way I can show up on those days where I'm trying to hit paces and sure i incur a little bit more muscular fatigue just because these faster paces are going to be a little bit more demanding on the skeletal muscular system um but you kind of trade that like lethargy feeling for okay i'm going to hit these certain paces um so i know that was just kind of a side tangent on you know my training but um since we got into mental fatigue having these different periods of volume and intensity can help navigate some of that mental fatigue as well i think so too and and then also kind of knowing um that your training cycle is going to be changing along the way and just kind of being aware of when that high load is coming so you can be prepared for it because you might have to work around a little bit, like you said, with your family, because it's going to be a little bit more time away when we're getting into that race specific specificity of a hundred and we're, you know, doing a lot longer runs, you know, leading up to that big race for a 50, you know, so we're, we're spending more time on that long run. But I also want to note that, you know, the long run isn't, isn't the like the biggest long run isn't the big deal right it's that accumulation all along that training plan which is going to get you to race day so saying you know putting it all into the long run isn't just where it's at i guess yep absolutely um and so I, I guess that puts a good wrap on training. You know, when should we feel fatigued? Um, you know, at what times is is fatigue good or bad? Um, you know, I guess the overarching implication is it's good at certain points when we know that it's coming, when we're expecting it to be coming, when your training load is the highest. It's bad when it's random. It's at the beginning of the block. It's before a race. So we can kind of navigate and say like, okay, maybe at this time I should feel a little bit fatigued. And then if there's any surprises in your energy levels or in your, um, your muscular fatigue levels, you can talk with your coach and just say, hey, you know what? Like, I don't feel like I should be this fatigued at this point in my training. Um, right. But we didn't really touch on racing. And I think that's a completely different conversation when we talk about muscular and metabolic fatigue in racing. So I guess in racing, is fatigue good or bad? Well, I think that, you know, we are, by the time we get to the race, the goal is to be able to um, have been training in that a bit of a fatigue state so that our body is ready and has after that taper that we, you know, incorporate at the end of our training to go right into that race. Hopefully that gives our body a time to recover. And then that's where that super compensation comes in. So our body has adjusted and adapted to that new training. And hopefully that will help in your race so that you're not getting to that fatigue place. But I'm not going to say that fatigue isn't going to set in later into a, a, an event. You know, that's where we're you know, I feel like my lady is, you know, of a hundred is, you know, bound to have some fatigue there. You've been using your same muscles over and over all day. You know, your, your body's tired. You're working really hard to balance, taking in that nutrition that I talked about, you know, to give you the energy that you need, but all of those things are starting to play a part. So I think um, that that's kind of where I, I look at with racing, like in the beginning of that race, hopefully you've went in with you know, fresh legs and a spring in your step after having that taper and, you know, your race starts out and that's the part where you're having to reel yourself back because you feel so good because you let your body recover and you're, you're feeling fresh and you don't want to go out too fast. That's where, you know, you got to really have some restraint, but then that later in that race, you're going to start to feel that fatigue that builds 
of, from using those same muscles. Absolutely. I would agree um, for sure. I would say that, you know, like fatigue is something during a race that we're always trying to mitigate and to avoid, right? This is where strategy comes in. Are we going to take the uphills faster? Are we going to take the downhills faster or slower? Um, you know, uh, you know, we want to be fueling ourselves so that we always have energy available, right? Like we want to keep up on our calories. We want to keep up on our sodium. Um, so it's something that is to be avoided, but it's absolutely expected, right? If we're pushing ourselves in the race, like, like you said, we're going to be feeling these things come mile 80 or even in a 50 K come mile 26, you know, it's like, you're not going to feel fresh as it, at least hopefully if you're, you know, pushing yourself, you're not going to feel fresh as a daisy. And that's if you're racing, right? If you're going out there and you're having fun and it's like, oh, I'm just taking this as it comes, you know, like that's, that's a different thing entirely. Um, but if we are racing and we're pushing limits, it's something that we want to avoid, but it's something that is going to come. So I think mentally preparing ourselves to say, you know what, I've trained as hard as I can. Maybe I arrived to the start line, super fresh, just already going through those mental, uh, those mental drills of you know, rehearsing, what is it going to feel like when I'm under heavy fatigue? How am I going to navigate that mentally? How am I going to navigate it um, emotionally? I know for me personally, you know, one, one big sign of metabolic fatigue or just needing more energy is if I'm out on a long run and I'm like, oh, why am I out here? Like, you know, I, I want to be home right now. Like this sucks. Everything hurts. If I'm in a bad mental space, I need more calories because I know mm -hmm. deep down, like I love being outside so much that like, if I'm like, Oh, this is stupid. You know, it's because I can't feel that my stomach's hungry. Yes. So I'm not sure if I lost Coach Reese or if he lost me, but our internet seems to be having a glitch. So I'm just going to take over a second until he comes back in. Um, but I um, also agree with that. I think that when we talk about those waves in ultra running where we're hitting highs and we're hitting lows, I think the best races I've had where those highs and lows haven't been such big spikes is by really keeping up with um, my nutrition and hydration and keeping like kind of like that slow IV drip all the way through. And that kind of keeps things a little bit more balanced. <laughs> so now we have uh, two coach races with us. Um, and I just kind of stepped in there and I was talking about the, you know, the highs and lows of ultra and those waves that come. But when we really are having significant differences, I think that's when we need to look at our nutrition and make sure that we're having a constant drip of nutrition steady the whole time so that we can kind of keep ourselves a little bit more even and we're not hitting into those low lows. So, you know, when you're out there racing and you're, you're feeling those lows, check yourself. Do I, have I, when's the last time I've had nutrition? How much nutrition am I getting in every hour? Am I getting in the right amount of hydration? Because those things are key factors. And I think keeping you a little bit more even in your, in your races. Absolutely. Thank you for stepping in there for me. My computer actually overheated and then shot, shot down. So, um, but it's good. That I love, I love that. I have, I have two Reese's here. Yes. Okay. Well, hopefully only one of us is talking at a time. Otherwise we have a problem. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's where too, like the old expression going in 10% undertrained is better than going in 1% overtrained, right? Because if we are at the start line and we're 1% overtrained, we've already hit that point where, the race hasn't even begun yet, but we're experiencing that like lethargy, that metabolic fatigue, maybe that muscular fatigue of like, oh man, my ankle's kind of blown out because I've been training super hard and my muscles haven't recovered. Um, or maybe it's, you know, like, um, I'm just super down. I don't really want to give a good solid effort, you know? So I think, um, you know, at the tail end of training, when you're recovering for these races, you know, going in with, with freshness over like pristine fitness is going to be huge just so that way we're not going in already fatigued. Right. And, you know, I just want to add to that. I know met we really didn't intend on talking about mental um, fatigue, but I think it just kind of interweaves with, you know, the metabolic and the muscular and, you know, going in fresh, like you said, I think it's important. You know, I, I even read before that Ann Trayson, he's, she's, you know, one of the greatest, right. Says that, you know, we need a, also need a mental taper, not just a physical taper. And I think that's really great words of wisdom that we can learn from. So, you know, when we're going into that, that last couple of weeks of taper, me personally, I try to stay away from 
any big decision making, um, anything that's going to cause me stress, because I know when I go into that race, I'm going to be making so many decisions throughout that race constantly that I need to have a fresh brain. And if I'm if I'm taxed from you know being too stressed outside of running, it's going to really kind of weave into my running, and um, and the results aren't always as good. Absolutely. So I think we touched pretty well on you know is like do we feel fatigue in training? Do we want to feel in racing? Is it good? Is it bad? When is it needed? It's definitely a byproduct of training and racing for sure. So it's something that is never to be completely avoided at, at any point. And, um, you know, knowing and expecting when the demands of training should be the highest will definitely help one planning their life and planning their training and just knowing when they can dish a little bit more energy towards their um, physical goals as opposed to other life goals too. So I think it really helps kind of um, put training into perspective, you know? Right. I like to think about um, the rule of thirds that Alexi Pappas shares. Mm -hmm. And um, she says, that if you're training for a big event, um, your training should be a third good, a third okay, and a third crappy. If it doesn't fall into those rule of thirds, then you may need to relook at your training and make sure you're okay. So I think that our conversation here today talks about more like, okay, if you're falling into a lot of crappy, then we need to look at that and make sure that you're not too far into muscular fatigue. But if the, you're falling into the, that thirds where you have that okay part, that okay is okay because we are expecting you to have some muscular and metabolic fatigue going through the training cycles, even with a very mindful, um, plan where you're slowly increasing in intensity and in volume, you're still going, that's normal. And that's what we would expect for you to do. And I think another thing that we talked about that I think is important to think about was sometimes, you know, we go into this race, now we're fresh. We don't, we have to plan for that muscular um, and metabolic fatigue, because if we don't, that's going to um, be a, maybe a shocker. And we're going to be like, why am I tired? I shouldn't be tired. I've been doing all of this training but that's normal and it's going to happen. So plan for it. Think about it. How are you going to get yourself out of it if that happens? Absolutely. And speaking of muscular fatigue, my right deltoid is a little bit taxed from holding my, <laughs> you know, okay. So we're going to switch and we're going to um, go into a listener question. This one is coming at us from Greg. Um, he asks about goal setting. He's wondering, so he wants to set new goals for his 5k PR right? So what can we realistically okay. expect from an athlete in a year, in two years, maybe in three years or so? And as we look down the line, so what are some factors going into your decision-making about, Hey, what is somebody's realistic expectation for, um, their year and their two-year goals? I mean, I think that you need to look at, yeah. Yeah. I think you need to look at where they are at. What are their, um, what's their experience with running? You know, how many years have they been running and what kind of events have they been doing? look at their injury history, you know, because some of those things are going to take um, into account how we are going to move them forward, look into their commitment and their consistency. All those pieces are huge factors in knowing where somebody is going to be able to go from here to, you know, from point A to point B. So I think those are things um, that are, are good to look at. Absolutely. What do you look at? I would say the same thing. I really like to look at, you know, what somebody's training age is. Let's say it's their first year running and we try, you know, we, we put in a good build towards a 5k and, you know, they give it a good solid effort. Um, but they, let's say, um, we know that they can be a little bit more consistent in their training, or maybe we could have done a little bit more of a specific block. Then I would say, Hey, you know what? Like, um, let's evaluate that question the next time we go to do a 5k block you know like what type of mileage are you running what type of intensities are you running and especially too like like you said maybe somebody has an older training age like they've been training for a while but they've been training mainly for like 50 miles and 100 miles and they really haven't touched their capacity at their higher intensity right, right. um this particular athlete of mine um you know like we basically just went through one block of 5k training. And now he's wondering, where can I set my sights for next year? And I would say that, you know, like right. training age, I would say, you know, like he's relatively new to that intensity. He said it felt really good and he really enjoyed it. So I think that's great. I think that, you know, within this season, let's say we circle back to it in the fall time. Um, I, I would expect that he could have a 10% 
increase around five to ten percent in his time just if he puts he keeps putting in consistency he stays injury free and he's able to give it some more gas and keep that stoke for the distance he's going to be entering right. into a longer block of training for um for some mountain runs um so in that case you know we can also use those longer events as just rough proxies for like okay what is your capacity but of course it's always difficult when somebody does nothing but run mountainous races and they're like i wonder what my flat fast 5k pace is going to be you know but that's where too i would talk right. with people hey like this intensity this is what you should be feeling maybe we run some proxy workouts that aren't super demanding but can kind of give us a gauge on what an athlete can do maybe i have them go run k intervals with a minute or two rest and just see right where their paces fall. Of course, like if you're going to do five by a K and you tell somebody to go run each K hard with a minute, minute and a half rest in between, it's not quite enough rest to completely like get rid of some of those fatigue factors. Um, but you'll start to see their pace slowly decline, right? So you can take some of the average paces there and uh, have a good proxy for about what their 5k pace should be. You can look at heart rate, you can look at RPE and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's a more in-depth conversation of like, Hey, how much more do you have to give, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Like, and I agree. I agree with that too. Um, you know, really kind of gauging, like when they are doing those hard efforts, what is the rate of perceived exertion? Do, are they pushing to their max and they couldn't hold that longer than that K or, you know, is it a pace that they could sustain for th you know, the three miles? And also I think it's, it's all relative to Am I coming in saying I want to PR my 5K and I already run a, run a 15 minute 5K, or am I coming in and say I want to PR my 5K and I'm a, I'm running a 30 minute 5K? I think that's also relative to the percentage of which you can um, PR. Absolutely, and I think too when we're coaching um, people, you know, like um, we've been, Greg and I have been in more of a um, you know a flat and fast kind of period of our running. Today he actually just completed a 10k time trial, so he's, uh, he's yay go Greg. Healthy. I haven't had a chance to look at the uh, look at the data yet, but that's where I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna look at it. I told him, hey, you know, don't feel feel like you have to absolutely max out this effort, but give it a hard effort. Give it one that you're proud of. Um, you know, try try not to leave too much on the table, and then we'll take a look at it and we'll make some. Um, We'll make some judgment calls based on that. And then you can kind of gauge, okay, what's about your 5k fitness right now? And then can we try to narrow that down a little bit? Maybe we run right. a little bit faster than what his current 5k pace is and, um, you know, try to, try to, try to narrow that down a little bit. So right. and I think with 5k too, you know, um, well, time trials are tricky, right? Um, they're, they're psychologically hard. You're not out there with the race energy. So, you know, things look a little bit different on race day. And um, since 5Ks, we can recover a lot quicker than some of the longer efforts, you know, building in a few so that one, you can get used to racing at that pace. You can um, get used to the race day anxiety, you know, so that you have a little time to build up to like, okay, this is really the one I want to go for my PR, but I'm going to throw in these others. So I feel really comfortable when I go run 5Ks because I think the more that you're running that 5k you get faster just just from that confidence level and that experience of running a 5k and feeling how it feels i mean i haven't ran a 5k in a long time but it is tough you know it feels tough and so you know getting used to that especially if you've been training maybe mountain races where you've been going a little bit slower or a little bit longer races that's a big difference you know of how you feel in a race in like Sure, in a hundred mile race, I'm super tired, but I'm not maxing out my heart rate. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's where when we're looking at, so we, we talked about these 5K uh, intensities. When we're looking at longer races, 50 miles, um, 100Ks, 100, 100 miles, we have to look at more factors, right? How long did you take stopping at aid stations? Maybe we don't increase your fitness whatsoever, but we just get you more efficient at your aid station work. Boom, you went from an hour stopped total to 30 minutes and you get a 30 minute PR in whatever right. distance, right? We have to look at, okay, how efficient were you with the uphills? How did your quads feel on the downhills? Um, what was your um, fueling like? Maybe we don't make any right. fitness um, gains it, per se, but we don't ever hit such a low that you're kicking tire, um, kicking rocks on the side of the trail instead of running on the flats, you know? Right, so right. 
repair to be made. So I think in these longer races, we have to think more strategically of like, okay, in training, we're trying to increase your fitness. So we're trying to give you a couple percentage points there, but we're also trying to hit all these strategical points of, you know, aid stations, mentality, um, fueling. So that way we can edge out a couple more percentage points and, and lower your overall time. That's kind of what I'm looking at right now for the Kettle Marine 100 coming up is, okay, how is my training right now compared to last year? Where can I, you know, go a little bit faster on the course? Um, how could I be a little bit more efficient at the aid stations? And then kind of gauge how much time can I chip off in each area for my overall goal? For sure. Yep. That will be exciting. And I'm excited to hear about Greg and how he progresses and in his 5K challenge, just get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah, totally. You know, we're not going to be running too many 5K time trials coming up because he does have um, a half marathon coming up and then he has some mountain races coming too. But I think it's a good question of like, hey, like, you know, he's fairly new to the, you know, pushing really hard at that distance. What can he realistically expect to set his sights for in a year or two, you know? So right. him right. and I are talking about that more and I can't wait to uh, talk with him. So shout out to Greg. Um, and I can't take a look at his data too. So that's uh, just the highlights of working with a coach. You get to really get into the weeds of like, what can you do, you know? Right. Wonderful, Loretta. Well, it was a great conversation, um, you know, and I think uh, I'd like to mention too that we're both very open to taking questions, um, whether it be our social profiles or DMs. So if anybody has any questions about their training, about life, about our training, our goals and whatnot, we'd love to hear them and just kind of talk about them. Um, so if anybody has anything they'd like to discuss, let us know, hit us up and drop Absolutely. us a line. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll, we'll add them into the end of our shows on our weekly shows. So we look forward to getting questions from everybody. We, we love to have the community be part of our, our talk. Absolutely. We'll take care Loretta. It was a pleasure catching up with you and, uh, we'll see you on the next week. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye.